Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. Yes, I am Bernard Beitman, MD, sometimes known as Dr. Coincidence, a psychiatrist. I study the mind and the brain. And in studying the mind and the brain, I look in the mind and brain's physical and cultural context. It's so important to notice that we don't exist on our own, really. We think we're independent creatures, but we're we're really part of the context that we're in. And more and more, we're having to recognize that because outside influences are influencing the way we think, the way we feel, and even and our self-definitions. And meaningful coincidences like synchronicity and serendipity provide clues to how our minds and our brains connect deeply to our bodies, other people, nature, and our environment. Meaningful coincidences occur in all aspects of life. If you pay attention to them, you got to look, you got to look, I mean, you got to think they're happening. And part of my job is to be a little like sprinkle the fairy dust of uh, coincidence awareness around the world as much as possible so that you'll pay more attention to the coincidences that are happening around you. You can pre-order my new book uh, called Meaningful Coincidences. Uh, it's, out, it's due out September 13th this year. The full title is Meaningful Coincidences, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendipity Happen. The order links for those of you on YouTube are, uh, are, are below. Uh, we are uh, facing, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know it, the sixth, the sixth, the sixth major extinction of life on our planet. It's happened five times. Everything's gone. Life-wise, I mean, and then we life has come back, including us. Um, but if we look at what we're doing now, just as COVID-19 uh, destroys and damages its host, that's us, uh, we human beings are destroying and damaging our host, Mother Earth. Many people recognize the danger of human complacency, especially young people who know that us older folks, that is those of us in political and economic power, just don't care that much about their future, about the future of younger people, because all we do is kind of like keep doing what we've been doing. Uh, we try to go back to the past and make it happen again as make it like MAGA people like trying to say nothing's happening. We've got to just do what we've been doing. Can't keep doing that. Much has to be done, including learning much better ways of how to get along with each other. I mean, we got a big problem to love each other in the many different ways love can be expressed. Meaningful coincidences help to establish and affirm and deepen relationships, relationships that recognize that each of us is part of the collective human organism and that each of us has a purpose in this organism to contribute to its optimal functioning. Find out what you're here for uh, and let us fit everybody together, but you got to want to do that first. Our guest today is developing an excellent, outstanding approach to uniting humanity in an effort to restore our wonderful potential playground here on Earth for learning and fun. I mean, this is we can have a lot of fun here and learn at the same time. Please listen carefully to Bill's message. The lives you save may be your children. Bill Hillel is PhD, is a professor emeritus at George Washington University. Professor Hillel has published seven books and hundreds of articles, consults with corporations and governments as a frequent keynote speaker, once substituting for Peter Drucker. He was cited by the Encyclopedia of the Future, there's more stuff about the future now because we got to pay attention to it, as one of the top futurists, top 100 in the world. He also served as a major in the U.S. Air Force, uh, an aerospace engineer on the Apollo program, 
That's cool. And a manager and a business manager in Silicon Valley. This guy has been around. Welcome to the show, Bill. And so glad you were able to join us. Thank you, Dr. Coincidence. It's great to be here. <laughs> hey, I like that one too. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could show you some videos but of Dr. Coincidence <laughs> in action, but what, this is about, it's more about you this time. Why don't you tell us about the the one coincidence that you remembered, maybe, or at least one of your coincidences. I was racking my brains and I came up with a good one. All right. Uh, my wife and I were visiting the, uh, the uh, National Museums, the Smithsonian Museums, and we went into the Museum of the American History, I think it's called, and we were just stumbling around. We saw this classroom, it was an entire classroom that was there behind glass, and I was fascinated by that, and I went to the plaque, and it explained the story. This was a classroom that they, uh, they uh, uh, that was destroyed. Uh, the, the building, the, the building was taken down. The uh, school was uh, replaced or something. So they they wanted to preserve a classroom, a typical classroom of the type that had welcomed immigrants into this country, and. Uh, it turned out this is a classroom that from the school I attended. <laughs> I probably sat in that very classroom, in the one that was on display, the Smithsonian. And it was such a wonderful coincidence. It just highlighted for me uh, my origins. I, I came here as an immigrant. I was five years old. I came with my parents at five from, years old. From where? Spoke, from Lebanon. I was born in Lebanon. I spoke no English, and I was thrown into the American school system, and I, I figured out how to uh, cope and how to speak English. Uh, and this classroom just really brought that all home. It was a wonderful experience. I, I recall it vividly. That is, a, as we like to say in this program, far out and groovy experience. It is. It, it really is. It's a, quite a surprise. You walk in there. Uh, I look at uh, this idea of human GPS that we end up going, being in places uh, that are important to us, uh, but we don't have a rational reason for having gone to that place that has something to do with what happens to us there. Uh, what made you get, what made you go there? Uh, to the museum? Uh, yes, we, to, we, to just, the museum. We, we do that uh, on really uh, on a uh, co constant basis. We, like Sundays, we, we take Sundays and we go somewhere. And this Sunday, we chose to go to the Smithsonian. Oh, you live in Washington? We live in D.C. Yeah. Right. And so this is a common occurrence for us. But uh, uh, when I saw that classroom and I saw the name, it was the Dunham High School. That was the school that I went to as a child in Cleveland. It was amazing. Uh, it, it was a testament to the... Uh, my uh, experience as an immigrant and the experience of millions of Americans who came here as immigrants. And it, it made me feel a part of that wave of immigration. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah. And this, the classroom from a school in Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, uh, I went to Moreland School, which was in Shaker Heights. Uh, oh, really? Elementary school, yeah. Um, so it's fun to hear a classroom in Cleveland. Um, and then somehow that classroom got, got put in the Smithsonian. It's really uh, it's amazing. It's really, yeah. And there so, you were. So we're, so we're both Cleveland, uh, Clevelandites. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we grew up in, uh, in uh, Cleveland Heights. Yeah, that was far yeah. away from Shaker Heights for me. Yeah, oh, I, I love Shaker Heights. Uh, especially that, uh, what's the name of the great boulevard that runs through Shaker Heights? Fairmont, Fairmont Boulevard. The gorgeous homes on Fairmont Boulevard. I love that. I had a paper route. I used to deliver papers to their, that area. <laughs> I loved those homes. Ah. They were these uh, great manors that were built by the uh, iron ore magnets who uh, imported iron ore and uh, and uh, shipped it to Detroit to build cars. All those millionaires who lived in Cleveland years ago. 
in its glory, Cleveland in oh, its glory. Yeah. yeah. Well, she you got was. and you got to you got to experience some of that and re-experience then walking into the Smithsonian, which not everybody gets to do. Hey, I went to school here. Um, and that's that's really cool. Um, so part of what uh, we're gonna talk about today is what what you mean by um, global consciousness and what you mean by beyond knowledge. And we're going to, our audience knows, we're gonna see if your concepts of global consciousness and my ideas uh, that under the term psychosphere uh, have some overlap, which we, we already established they do in our pre-meeting here, but how they overlap and where they come together and how it is that uh, Bill and Bernie here can have somehow find a, a synthesis that can bring other people into recognizing that we're all part of this greater mind, that we don't have to go to the universe. We have enough trouble just staying here on earth to do the global consciousness of us human beings and our earth. So what do you mean by these, these terms beyond knowledge and global consciousness? Well, let me uh, start by noting that this is uh, from my new book, Beyond Knowledge, How Technology is Driving an Age of Consciousness. Uh, Good. If, if you're interested, you could go to uh, beyondknowledge.org and find a nice synopsis of the book. Good. And it's, it's basically a study of social evolution. I, I took historic uh, data uh, and I used it to map the, the rise of civilization through the various stages of development from agrarian society to industrial society, to a service economy, knowledge age. And then the next logical step I think is consciousness. And I, I can explain that more fully, but just to make it uh, uh, put in simple terms, um, everything beyond knowledge is by definition consciousness. So I think consciousness is the next logical stage of development uh, that, and we're in it now, right now, I, I estimate we entered the age of consciousness about the year 2020. And uh, let me explain why I think 2020. First of all, the, the trajectory of civilization moving through these stages has accelerated dramatically. It took uh, thousands of years of agrarian society to develop the industrial age and it took just a hundred years to go from the industrial age to the service economy, just a hundred years. And then just 50 years to uh, reach the knowledge uh, age from the service, from services. So you can see the process is accelerating dramatically, hundred years, 50 years. So you would expect the next stage would be something like 30 or 20 years. That's exactly what I think has happened. Could you define what you mean by knowledge age? Yeah, well, um, as I said, by, by definition, everything beyond knowledge uh, is consciousness, but knowledge is the things that computers are good at, uh, acquiring information through our perceptions, storing that information in, in memory, uh, creating, uh, adding, uh, acquiring knowledge, and using that knowledge to make decisions. And that is uh, what I would, what, I, the sci what science calls objective consciousness. That's well established in the scientific world, uh, the term objective consciousness as opposed to subjective consciousness. And consciousness, uh, as, as I see it, is the subjective domain, which is beyond knowledge beyond the knowledge domain, beyond the objective type of consciousness. Well, that, that, those, are, it's, those are key distinctions to make, and our words are often not sufficient, because uh, subjective has knowledge in it too. Uh, but you're not, you don't mean that. You mean knowledge, when you say knowledge age, it's stuff that you can record and play back externally. It's outside of right. you. When exactly. you're talking about subjective, it's, information that can be conveyed externally and stored externally, but its beginning is within the self, within the within somebody, it's subjective where nobody else can see it, apparently. Exactly, exactly. As, and, it, and it varies from individual to individual. That, that's the, the key, that subjective consciousness is, is individualistic. 
Uh, and it's arbitrary. People can dream up whatever subjective consciousness they want. And they do. And they do. <laughs> and exactly, that's exactly one of the reasons that we can be confident that we're entering an age of consciousness now, precisely because people are using subjective consciousness wildly. People dream up the most bizarre beliefs and they, they hold them ferociously. Yeah. Uh, I, I think of it as uh, the post-factual phenomena. Uh, it, it's beyond knowledge. People are believe anything. There's on the right wing, there's the big lie, uh, the fact, the belief that vaccination uh, is, is bad for you, uh, that uh, the climate is really not a serious problem. On the left wing, it's being woke, canceling people. So it's all around us. Uh, this, this, uh, this tendency to, to believe almost anything really, uh, detached from reality, really. Uh, it's, it's a new phenomenon. It's always been around, of course, but now it's, it's been amplified by social media. Social media and the digital revolution have, are driving all of this. I think that's so clear what you're saying there, Bill, um, uh, is this subjective consciousness has a big downside in it in the sense that you can just make up stuff and believe that it's true. There's, there is a consequence to making up stuff that is not what we might call realistic uh, or objective uh, that you're addressing somehow. Could you tell us about how, that, how you're looking at that problem? Well, uh, the, the challenge that this poses is getting people to agree on on some basics, and that's that's tough. That's, that's tough. where we are now. Yeah, that's where the world is now. We're stuck in a early stage of consciousness of global consciousness that is not very good. It's very unhealthy. People are believing things that are divorced from reality, and somehow the world has to come together. And uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think any of us know how this is going to happen, really. I, I can surmise, I have some ideas, but none of us really know. The world well, has to... Let me, have a, let me give you my, my part of the answer, uh, answer to that, Bill, and please, see what you think please, about yes. it. Yeah. Uh, be, because I, I, I put this in terms of we are in a battle for human imagination. Yes. Uh, yeah, try, yeah. Trying to like, my way of imagining is better than yours. So you kind of imagine with me what i'm doing and what you and i are talking about is imagining what's real yeah. uh, and trying to put in subjective consciousness what we might call is reality yeah. and what where i bring to this is uh coincidences because throughout human history coincidences have shown people correlations and connections between and among things that weren't readily evident in the in the past yes. uh, you see you see a mark on a tree uh back in the old days and uh, then after a while you start noticing that there's a particular animal that's around there so you connect the re the the mark on the tree with the animal that you might want to be hunting so there's a correlation that becomes a, a causation that you can then use as a way of defining how the world works you can find you can hunt better and coincidences have st still have that capacity of telling us how reality works. And so I am trying to be able to get a systematic way of understanding coincidences to help us define what's real. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I'm trying to, uh, to grasp the, your ideas, uh, Bernie, and, and uh, weave them into mine and vice versa. Yes. So let's let's uh, make sure we, we try and do that. But let me go back to uh, subjective conscience. I define, I, I like to uh, make this very uh, operational. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm, a, uh, I'm leery of these very exotic uh, uh, ways of talking about consciousness. And so I like to make it operational. And I think of subjective consciousness as emotions, values, beliefs, and higher order thought. All of that, it's, it's an enormous domain in its own right. Uh, you can add wisdom in there and vision and, and lots of other things. Um, but there's a very precise distinction between objective consciousness 
and subjective consciousness. The scientific world understands that. And we are making that transition now from the objective world, the knowledge age that we've been in for two decades. It started in the year 2000. And uh, now we're entering the age of consciousness where it decisions, events are dominated by emotions, values, and beliefs. That's, that's a very precise idea. There shouldn't be any doubt about that. Uh, and I think we entered uh, the, the consciousness age, the year 2020, and I'll tell you why. This started, the, the post-factual stuff started maybe 10 years before that, but I think it reached a climax in 2020 when we saw an insurrection on, the, on our political system. That is a, a dramatic event, and I think it, it marks the, the beginning uh, of the age of consciousness because it became deadly serious at that point, 2020. So I feel pretty confident in that, uh, using 2020 as the beginning of the age of, of consciousness. And my little company, TechCast, has studied this. Uh, we use, uh, we have 200 experts. We pool their knowledge uh, using a system of collective intelligence to forecast various things. And we did that with, uh, consciousness, we ask people, uh, do you think major decisions in family life and individual life, organizations and governments are made on the basis of objective knowledge or subjective consciousness? And it turned out that they think 60% or more of these decisions are made on a basis of subjective factors, emotions, values, and beliefs. And in some cases, it's higher. In organizations, it's uh, about 65%. For individuals and family, it's like 70%. And for government, it's like 75%. They, they think that government is, is run on the basis of beliefs and emotions. And it is, clearly. Look at the, the major issues of our time. Abortion, uh, climate, immigration. Those, those issues are not being decided based upon a rational analysis of facts. They're being... Uh, uh, they're political footballs because uh, various parties have different belief systems and they, and they want power and, and there's, there's a lot going on, of course, but it's, it's not a lot of rational logic. It's based on subjective values and beliefs. So I think we're in this uh, age of consciousness right now. That's why things uh, are so uh, perplexing because people can say almost anything and, and believe it fervently. They're convinced of it. Uh, so it's a different world. Uh, that much I, I, I think we know. I, I what, think what do you do with uh, intuition? Well, intuition is part of subjective consciousness. I think. Yes. And you don't mention it partly because it's not so definable, but it's, it's having knowledge and you don't know where it's coming from exactly. Yeah. There, there, there are a, a myriad aspects of subjective consciousness. Yes, 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 yes. Intuition, yes. Uh, understanding. Uh, you can people will, will give you lots of different terms that uh, uh, fall you, into that same but, category. But to, from a, from a practical kind of guy, you are uh, emotions, values, uh, and higher intellect and beliefs. Yeah, uh, I, I like that. Emotions, values, beliefs. That's a good place to start. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, that's. And, uh, and there's, there are lots of other aspects of that. This is getting really clear to me. I've talked with you before, but this is really clear to me now about what you mean by consciousness. Unfortunately, the word consciousness has a lot of different uh, it does. You know, connotations. And I know guys who are talking about it's all consciousness, that every, the universe is all consciousness. And it's, tr it's, it's troubling because... I don't, they don't know what the universe is because it's expanding faster than the speed of light and they don't know what consciousness is because it's expanding with it and you can project all kinds of beliefs that you want on there but there there's some truth in a lot of different places and i think i'm more into the uh like uh we're, the weirder stuff than you are uh that and i, ha I but i try to be as as operational as I can within that sphere. And that's uh, where we have somewhat different uh, perspectives, but that I'm, we're, I'm getting 2020 and, uh, and January 6th uh, as the turning point 
for what was happening anyway, where people are yet using what you're calling consciousness, what I'm, I'm calling like um, beliefs uh, with you, your beliefs, oh. emotions, and right. values, and trying to press them on to the rest of the people around them. And the reason that's that right. that's important, I want to ask you, we want to come back to what you were, you, you know what you're about to say, but I am very, uh, as a psychotherapist, uh, I'm disturbed by the lack of future awareness among psychotherapists. The psychotherapists mm. tend to talk more about the past and maybe the present and what you're feeling now. But what we do as human beings is create futures. Yes. We imagine futures all the time. Yes. I mean, the sports guys are saying what's going to happen in the next game and political commentators are what's going to happen with this politician. Is Trump going to do this or is that? But, but what, they're always talking about what might happen. The stock market is a lot of different predictors. There's a lot of future orientation and future minds. And psychotherapists don't do that very much to help create these expectation videos that are going to help people function. What do, how do you how do you Okay, I'm trying to say the collective human organism needs to develop collectively an, a vision of the future that's practical and based on what's real around us. That's what exactly you, right. That's, so that's, that's really uh, uh, the purpose I think we're, we're, uh, we're, fa we're facing. We have to accept <clears throat> the responsibility as a species, as, as a civilization for... Uh, a maturity, a sense of maturity in our consciousness. That's the best way I, I, I can put it. Uh, we have to, it's very much like a child uh, growing through uh, the crisis of maturity to become an adult. Uh, when they're, when uh, they reach the age of teens, teens uh, are bordering on adulthood and and they can run amok. Uh, I've, I've raised two children and I see it my kids it's everywhere uh, they have a hard time figuring out who they are what they want to do and they get into serious trouble and when the pain gets uh, too severe for them they finally at some point uh, wake up they grow up and they accept responsibility they define who they are as best as they can they set objectives and they become adults that's roughly where we are as a civilization we have to uh, accept our responsibility uh, as to what we want to do with this planet, uh, be realistic about it, develop a, a vision or a, a global consciousness. You could call it various things. You could call it a global ethics if you like, but we have to develop some kind of a, uh, a belief system. Every society has to have a belief system. It can't function otherwise. It can be communism, atheism, it can be capitalism, it could be anything. But every society, functioning society, has to have some kind of belief system in order to function effectively. And we need a, a global consciousness or a global ethics, whatever you want to call it. A, sim, a few simple principles that are universally acceptable. For instance, respect for the planet respect for life on the planet. Uh, you could call it sustainability or other things. That's one fundamental belief system that I think we have to, we have to agree on and accept that the, 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 plant, the life of the planet is foundational to civilization. We can't live without that. And that's not the case. People do not believe that. They, they uh, use the planet's resources in very irresponsible ways. That has to stop if we want to have a future. And another major uh, principle would be cooperation. You could call that other things. You could think of that as interdependence or collaborative problem solving, but we have to learn to cooperate as, as a civilization on, on the things that count on the global issues, because the fact is, it really is a global world now, a unified world. The ecological systems are all unified. The environment is all unified, whether you like it or not. The economic systems are unified. That's why we had, uh, we suffered from the failure of supply chains during the pandemic, because those are global supply chains. And the electronic systems are all unified in the internet. 
the thing that's lacking is a political counterpart, uh, uh, some way of, of managing our, our, our world as a single whole, because the problems are global problems and global problems require global solutions. The pandemic is a good example. A pandemic is a global phenomenon and it can't be solved with local solutions. So we badly need some way to come together and solve these global problems with global solutions. And that means we have to cooperate. So those are two simple uh, ideas. It, it can be much more complex. There are lots of ideas about uh, a global consciousness or a global ethics, and that has to be worked out, of course. In fact, that's one of the big challenges that I am uh, addressing right now. There, I have a group of friends and colleagues who, are, uh, who see the, the, the same urgency of this, this challenge, the need for a common set of global beliefs. And so we're forming a global consciousness project. It's being housed in a, a little, an institute run by Laura Lee and Paul Ward. Um, and they're taking it on as a, one of the projects for their institute. And we're in the startup phase now. We hope to uh, get funding and create a powerful website that brings together all of the people like Dr. Coincidence here, who are concerned with consciousness, bring them all together so we can collectively figure out what global consciousness uh, should look like and work together on this and to offer whatever uh, tools each of us can offer, uh, courses, tutorials, lectures, reading material, whatever. And one of the features of this project uh, is what we, we call a, a portal to global consciousness. We hope to use audiovisual, uh, powerful audiovisual technologies like virtual reality, perhaps, to take people through the experience of moving from their present state of consciousness to a global consciousness. We're going to make this uh, a powerful experience where people shift their consciousness. They move over 20 minutes or 30 minutes into a state of consciousness that is convincing, is compelling. And when, they, when this is completed, uh, ideally they would say, ah, so that's global consciousness. I love it. <laughs> that would be the ideal, that people would be uh, ecstatic at experiencing global consciousness. And people experience it all the time. For instance, so when um, uh, Captain Kirk, when he took uh, that uh, trip with Jeff Bezos into near Earth orbit, he came back, he was so emotional. He was ecstatic. He had experienced global consciousness. He saw the Earth as a single whole with all of the, the ecological systems being fragile and so forth. And he came back and he was just so enthusiastic. He went on and on about it. He experienced global consciousness. And that's what we need to save civilization. We need to have a global consciousness that is widely accepted, widely uh, believed in. That uh, right now, uh, the, the consciousness that most people operate on are the, the principles that we inherited from the industrial age, economic man. Uh, the idea that that was uh, made clear by uh, uh, Max Weber, the Protestant ethic, and that focuses on self-interest, money, and power. Those are the values that govern the world now. They were valuable during the industrial age, and they may still be valuable in the future, but they have to be supplanted with a global consciousness, or we're not going to survive as a civilization. Let me stop there. I, I think those are the key points. Well, uh, you know, I, I write stuff too. And oh, just where, why don't you repeat where people can see what you're talking about? Read, read online. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. Beyondknowledge.org. Beyondknowledge.org. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I've had to deal with people talking about consciousness from various from a different perspective from what you're talking about. Uh, well, that's the, that's the, the Jungian perspective, the Carl Jung. 
that uh, the universe is filled with this, this consciousness, this energy that, that uh, envelopes us all, that it governs our lives. And that's, that's, that's true. I think that is true. But what's manifested is different. What we actually live with is different. It's our actual beliefs and values and emotions. And that's where I'm focusing on the operational consciousness, what people are actually living and experiencing. Well, yes. Uh, and that's what, what I don't know. This is the right place to do it, but I think we need a different term for what you mean by consciousness here because the word has so many different meanings but i yes, see right. i see how you use it and i'm not going to try to to try to do a kind of editing here with how you're talking about it because i'm having some idea about what you mean and what i would want to add to what you're talking about it's not just my emotions my beliefs my values it's a recognition that there's a reality out there and we can bump into it and we rely on that earth that's around us and all the stuff that we are able to get from it as well as from each other to be able to survive. There is something real out there and that we are part of what that reality is and that, that we are merged with it far better than we can. But this is, this is part of what you mean by global consciousness, I think, is recognizing the reality of our lives here on Earth and, try, yeah. and trying to map it. And I am adding not, I'm adding to what you're talking about, the, the idea of the psychosphere, that part of the reality of this life on Earth is that we share uh, consciousness on Earth with each other. Yes. That we, that we put ideas out into this yes. psychosphere. We get ideas back from the psychosphere. Right. And we are influenced by it. And we connect to other people through it. And this is an additional reality that yes. I'm pretty sure is there, which coincidences help us see, which needs to be part of the, uh, let's say, construct, the imagine, the idea of this reality that we are in. So you're talking about getting a rea getting understanding our reality. I think that's- yeah, Yes, know, that's right. Consciousness has to be realistic. I mean, you can't believe that you can fly, for instance, you know, and <laughs> you can well, believe that, but you're, that's a dangerous belief if you jump off of a building. So, uh, as has happened. Uh, right. uh, so, yeah, uh, consciousness does not uh, obviate uh, knowledge. Uh, knowledge is still crucial. It has to inform uh, higher consciousness. No question about that. I think that's true. Uh, yeah. It has uh, to be realistic. Yeah, you have to be what, and what is real. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what is real is uh, been a problem. That's why I do this coincidence thing is because yeah. I'm trying to figure out what's real and I'm finding stuff that's realer than what NASA might say, at least traditionally is real. But when you get out of the outside, well, it's all, but we're agreeing here that we got to define reality together. We have to have some agreement that yes. there's something out there and that we're part of that something out there that's really in us too. And that right. we got to deal with it. But the reality is we're, we're junking Mother Earth here and we can't keep doing it. That's fundamental respect for the earth and being able to cooperate with each other i call it love in the different and the different manifestations those are fundamental to what bill you are talking about and what you mean by the uh, the next level of consciousness or consciousness those two things respect for earth cooperation Yes. interdependency yes. are fundamental to my way of thinking, your way of thinking, and our wonderful starting places as we try to figure out what this reality is that we are in, which we probably need to be able to keep getting some reality checks about what's happening here. Yeah, I, I, maybe a, a useful distinction, Bernie, would be uh, uh, individual consciousness versus universal consciousness. Because what you're talking about, I think, is uh, what Carl Jung would call universal consciousness. It, it, it uh, permeates the universe, and we all uh, uh, are animated by it. But I, and I'm focusing on the consciousness that an individual experiences, what's in their minds. Very the, important. 
very yeah. important. And I'm talking about not Jung's, what he called it Unus Mundus, one world, or yeah. quantum fields, which is now a kind of popular thing too, uh, that it's all this pervasive universal mind thing. I right. mean, I'm not saying it isn't there either, but I think the psychosphere might be um, a holographic representation of the yes. whole thing. So, I think that's exactly right. Hol holography, I think you're exactly right. I, so I, wa I want to just, I'm nearsighted, so I want to just say what's going on here on Earth, which is the psychosphere that we are part of. And you yeah. are interested in the individual mind, which is so vital, because that's what this is all built by i'm also interested in connections with people the interpersonal yes. part of yes. it and also the na nature since i connect with trees i have this thing with trees that it's getting deeper i was surprised to see that last <laughs> week where mm -hmm. i i have a little kind of i have a kind of um like a little resistance to it but the, i was out there with the trees last saturday and I was becoming more and more one of them. I, I, <laughs> I love it. They were they were accepting me. I was standing around with the, all these trees in the forest, and 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 I was becoming one with uh, one of them. Uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I love trees. Trees are are so foundational. The, the way they're rooted in the earth, the way they're rooted in the earth, and they grow to the sky. They're amazing. You were right. They're my metaphor because I yeah. like to have my cleats in the ground from a football yeah. metaphor yeah. and my mind in the sky. Yeah. And that's what they do. But they also have this wood wide web <laughs> where, where they connect with each other in the yeah. forest. Yes. So, so it's, it's an as above, so below or below is as above. Uh, that the psychosphere is a is a reflection of what the trees do with each other. They connect with yes. each other and they're hidden and the psychosphere is hidden uh, but it connects us with each other in ways that we're not quite aware of yes uh, that's a reminder that really all life shares consciousness trees are conscious uh, animal life is conscious they're all connected they they they're aware of their environment they take action to protect themselves against predators no you're exactly right animals are conscious we all share it in fact, you know, I, I lately, I find myself thinking that a better way to think about events of the day, uh, the, the, the nat, uh, global events, national events, uh, they're, not, they're not actions that individuals take as so much as they are a drama. It's a, it's a global drama that's being played out uh, symbolically, and it, it has its own logic. It, it unfolds the way a three-act play would unfold. Uh, there's a drama to it. There's to what? A drama to what, Bill? To uh, life. I mean, the yeah. way the way our politics in this country is unfolding. It's like a great drama. And the yeah. Way national pol the global politics unfold. Right now, it's it's Putin's attack on Ukraine that has seized attention. It's part of the drama, and it warns us of the dangers of wars of aggression. We're reminded of that. We thought we had overcome that. Yeah, Putin has made it clear that it's still there, and uh, it's a it's a metaphor for the dangers of acting unilaterally, of being selfish, uh, of the the old ideology, the old consciousness uh, that I want what I want regardless of what you care, what you. What you want and i'm going to get it i'm going to take it from you so it's, it's a it's a great drama that's being played out and i think that's why the world has united pretty well uh with some exceptions of course against putin it's a, it's amazing to me the way the world uh, came together in support of ukraine and it was only con possible i think because of social media i don't think this would have happened uh, 20 or 30 years ago uh, uh, social media is is an enormous problem because it spreads disinformation. It has everybody confused, but it also it's a powerful technology that can be used for good as well, and it's being used for a good purpose in supporting Ukraine. So, uh, what are some uh, of the other 
potential positive uses of technology, Bill? Well, um, um, offhand, I, I'm not, I can't. Come well, on. you mentioned one, the use of virtual reality to bring, bring people into uh, the more global uh, ethics that you were talking about. Yeah, that's, that's what we have in mind. Uh, well, I think the, uh, when we have world events like the uh, global Olympics, the, the technology makes that possible. We can all share in that, and that becomes a global event that everybody participates in. So that the technology well, there. I, I, that's, that's a, a curious that one of the, the variables I think that uh, w with uh, Laura Lee's Institute uh, to come up with is the other ways that technology can help bring around the global consciousness, the global awareness and individual that you're that you're talking about. And uh, yeah. for me, it's again, my part of this is coincidence awareness. That's I, I bring that I played wide receiver and running back. And this is I'm playing I'm playing Dr. Coincidence in this game. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I contribute. But I can't do this myself. None of us can. And that's what I bring to to the game uh, of trying to like make people more ethical. And I, I like the global ethics idea, uh, again, terminology wise than consciousness because the ethics are two things at least, uh, respect for mother earth respect, or father earth, some people are able to say now, yes. and respect for uh, uh, our interdependency, which coincidences yes. tend yes. to be able to show. And that, that global ethics, gets to what again my idea is vision well, to create a, an imagine to imagine a future that we want to have and begin to get the ways to get to that future which exactly if that future has to be ethical exactly. more than ethical it's got to be one that can allow us to survive human beings because we're not going to be able to survive and maybe we shouldn't i mean some people think okay blow it up blow the whole thing up but it's more fun to try to stay alive so that's what we're doing here is trying yeah, to be able we, to make it happen you know, when, when i talk when i introduce the idea of, of uh, the need for a global consciousness i use the, the the terms you use a vision it's the same it, and this does not mean a uh, utopia or something that's unrealistic or fanciful or or uh uh, you know, will, wishful thinking, it's a vision in the sense that a business person would use it. If a business person wants to introduce a new product, they have to have a vision for the product. They have to be able to imagine it. And if they can envision it, and if it's realistic, then they can do it. So that's the sense that I use uh, global consciousness. We're trying to envision a, uh, a plan or a set of principles or whatever that would enable the world to be sustainable so that we would not kill ourselves on this planet. So I think it's a very practical way of thinking about vision. I, I agree with you. And I, I, I prefer the term global vision um, yeah. uh, and to have a global vision in the mind of each of us, which has the two elements of earth and interdependency and cooperation. Yeah. And yeah. I think you that you're putting your hold hand in your head not just your finger on what we got to be able to get people to recognize right and how and, you know uh, going back to uh, coincidences I, I i like to think uh coincidences fit nicely into the the view of life as a drama rather than a logical uh, unfolding it's, yeah it, you know it has its own its own logic it, it's it's a story yeah it's it's, it's a journey it's a story. It's a, a story is a good thing. And we're, we're yeah. in a movie and yeah. we, we're in a movie as well. I'll say it, we're in a video now with all the videos out there. And we are as a human species can create a video of our future. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I'm into. Yeah. I, I could, I could do that playing football. Imagine making a, a <clears throat> taking the opening kickoff for a touchdown and i got a, a movie to show that i did that uh just because it was fun to imagine it and make it happen and i learned athletes learn to imagine and making things happen that the imagination comes first so expectation videos is the term i was using imagination videos but rather than consciousness you're trying to say to each individual mind imagine a future yeah. in which we respect earth and in which we are 
inter recognizing our interdependency. Yes. I, I think that's what you're. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it's all, it, 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 uh, I try to be practical. Uh, you know, I'm a, basically a business professor. So I, I uh, uh, my love for this is, is runs through everything I've, I've been doing ever since I was a graduate student at Berkeley. And that's where I first fell in love with this. I, I came across Daniel Bell's book, The Coming of Post-Industrial Society. Ah. And I could see that the computer was going to transform the world. And I fell in love with that idea. And I've been studying that ever since. And it's, it's, it's coming to a conclusion now in our lifetimes. That's what's really amazing. That the, the process of social evolution is reaching a culmination in the next few decades. We are privileged to be alive when this is happening, and we bear the responsibility to make it succeed. We bear that responsibility. We've got to start acting that way. We do not act that way now. We act like the teenager who is still running amok. We have to be the teenager that finally shapes up and uh, figures out what he wants to do. Uh, so we, we have to... Uh, assume the responsibility for the success of life on the planet. It's a big responsibility. I have some ideas about how this could work out, but it's, it's uncertain, of course. Uh, we used our, our TechCast uh, uh, experts to probe this idea, and th 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 these studies are available if anybody's interested. Uh, we estimate that... Uh, a global consciousness is likely to emerge about 2030, plus or minus about five years. I think that's a good forecast. I think that sounds right. Uh, I uh, forecast the beginning of the knowledge age uh, at the year 2000, in 1970. And I could see that that was a solid forecast and it, it happened just, just about exactly then, the year 2000. And that's the way I feel about a global consciousness. I, I feel pretty confident about that. But it's, it's going to happen in a complicated way. We, we uh, see, uh, see it happening through muddling through, that is uh, no major decision to adopt global consciousness, but just uh, continue to, to behave as normally, but keeping in mind the need for sustainability and the need for cooperation. And if we do that, as we address big crises, consciousness will evolve. It will emerge gradually, incrementally, if we keep those ideas firmly in mind. Uh, it could also emerge uh, as a whole. That is, at some point, a significant number of leaders in media and government and business and academia could collectively start saying, we've got to develop a global set of values, a global ethics. So it could, it could happen either way. That's our best thinking, but the, you know, there's, this is a low probability and there's a lot of uncertainty about this. We don't know. And I like to, uh, when I give talks like this, I like to ask the audience what they think is likely to happen. What is their sense of how the crises uh, are going to be resolved. Uh, what would global consciousness look like for them? And I like to explore that because it's a great uncertainty about this, no question about it. And I think it's the right thing to do, Bill, is to ask the audience um, yeah. because the audience is who we're talking about and they, yeah. need, to be th they need to be thinking about it. As, no, we exactly. come as we come near the end of our, our time together, Bill, um, uh, the, the idea of responsibility um, is so self-responsibility, so vital. And what I run into quite commonly with coincidence discussions is that people want to um, suggest that the coincidence has been caused by something like God or, ra or random chance, each of which may have some influence. Mystery is always around us and, and probability uh, does play a part in defining a coincidence. But we have a lot more to do with making them happen than people often want to recognize. So in, a, in the small way of coincidence discussions, I'm trying to help people become more responsible for their creation, 
which yeah. is just another step in trying to get people to recognize that each of us is responsible for what happens to planet Earth and to our people on it and the living beings on it. Yeah, I, I think res the responsibility is is the key. Uh, it's, it's the key. And, and, and we there, there's a terrible lack of responsibility. Americans, for instance, are so quick to to claim their 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 rights and their freedoms, but they they show no interest in the equivalent responsibilities. Correct. I mean, you can't have rights without responsibilities. It's unless it's just, you want to believe that you can. Well, yeah, I like the gun thing. I mean, they want the, the right to carry guns, and but there's no talk of responsibility. Yep, yep. And part of the psychotherapist's job is to show people they're responsible, but that's what we're up to. I think uh, responsibility for what happens in yeah. each of us is key to this whole thing. Uh, yeah. And so we've come, as we come to the end of this, Bill, I think we're talking about, um, about, mother earth or talking about earth or sustainability we're talking about interdependency and cooperation and we're also talking about individual responsibility yes and i i think adding that to the, the three major to the, your two major ethical ideas is what you were talking about doing and i'm i'm big on that as looking for what i had to do with to making this happen yeah yeah well, it, it, it's a great, uh, a great challenge. It's the, it's the greatest challenge that uh, the, the planted life on, on Earth has faced, I think, to well, become a, a mature civilization. It's an enormous challenge. Yeah. But I, I think it's, I think it's likely to succeed. I, I think it's a natural process of development, of social development. And despite the horrible things that are going on, I think it's going to work out. I just have that sense. Well, it helps to envision that it's going to work yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, right. it helps. Yeah, it's right. all part of it. Instead of going into a hole and says nothing like yeah, it's all yeah. going to go, all going to go bad. Well, yeah. as we end, Bill, uh, I, I like to ask people at the end to tell us something personal about themselves, which you have a five-year-old immigrant from Lebanon uh, yeah. <laughs> going to Cleveland Heights. We, yeah. We we got we got that part of it. Is there anything else about <laughs> Bill that we could that uh, but might be nice to leave the, our audience with? Uh, well, I love my garden. <laughs> my garden is uh, a great joy in my life it, because it's my connection to nature and through the whatever these great forces are that govern life, the spiritual forces. You know, whether you want to call it God or whatever, I don't know who who this God would be. But through my garden, I am in touch with the forces that govern life. And it's a great source of wonder to me and great satisfaction. The way you feel about when you're with the trees, Bernie, that's, that's the way I feel in my garden. That's right. And we need more people being able to have experiences like that. There's, there's yeah. a lot for us to learn out there and yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Bill, um, thank you very much for uh, being with me. I, I I wasn't sure about how this was going to go, but it's really been a pleasure talking with you. I feel uh, the same way. I think we really connected uh, intellectually, Bernie. Uh, well, I, I, I'd add my heart a little bit into that too, Bill. So yeah. <laughs> add, I'd, I'd like to include that part of it too. So yeah, yeah. maybe the with the Laura Lee's um, umbrella thing uh, and yeah. the Kayamunga Institute that you're going to be part of, uh, that uh, we'll, we'll be able to talk again about our various contributions. I like hearing what you're talking about because it just shows me that we are playing different roles in this thing, but it's part of the same team. It is the same thing. It's sort of the same team. Yeah. Well, uh, when this, when this uh, uh, project of global consciousness becomes a reality, we'll be inviting you to join us, Bernie. We'll be glad to be participating. Right. And some other people from the Coincidence Project will probably want yeah, to be involved good. too. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. You're welcome, Bill. It's a pleasure getting to know you better. Bye-bye, my friend. Bye, Bill. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.